Hi Eri, welcome to lesson four of ecosystems. You can see our starter today then has eight questions which uh, feature information from our previous lessons of this topic. So pause the video and see how many you can answer correctly. So let's go through the answers. For question one, what are the reactants of photosynthesis? That is carbon dioxide and water which is CO2 plus H2O. What are the products of photosynthesis? That is glucose and oxygen. Where does water enter the plant? So that is in the roots. Where does carbon dioxide enter the plant? That is in the leaf via the stomata. Where in the cell does photosynthesis occur? So that is the chloroplast. What is the green pigment called? That is chlorophyll. Which plant cell contains many chloroplasts? That is the palisade cell. And then three adaptations of a leaf are large surface area, they're thin, and have lots of chloroplasts. So this lesson looks at factors affecting photosynthesis. And what we're going to cover is being able to list those factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. Describe how those factors affect the rate and then be able to interpret graphs that look to demonstrate the impact of factors on the rate of photosynthesis. So our starting point is this law of limiting factors. Now this is a law that can apply to lots of different situations. And what it describes is when a process depends on two or more factors, the rate of that process is limited by the factor which is in shortest supply. Now remember rate is, is like the speed of a reaction. So in our case we're talking about photosynthesis. We're going to look at what factors impact that rate of photosynthesis. But remember photosynthesis itself will be limited by whichever factor is in shortest supply. Now, before we go into detail about photosynthesis, I'm actually going to start with an analogy. And I'm going to use an analogy of baking a cake. And to be more precisely, baking a sponge cake. I've picked a really simple, basic cake recipe here. And I'm going to use this as our example to explain the law of limiting factors and then apply it to photosynthesis. So our recipe here for our sponge cake is this. 200 grams of softened butter, 200 grams of golden cast sugar, 4 large eggs, and 200 grams of self-raising flour. So, now that we have our recipe, we're going to use this to determine how many cakes we can bake. Now, we must have these exact amount of ingredients to be able to make one sponge cake. We're going to use this then to discuss limiting factors. So, question here I've got for you is you're going to have two people. We've got David and Jane. They want to bake sponge cakes. They only have the following ingredients at home. What I want you to think about is how many cakes, following their exact recipe above, can they bake? So David has 400 grams of butter, 400 grams of sugar, four large eggs, 400 grams of self-raising flour, whereas Jane has 800 grams of softened butter, 1,000 grams of sugar, 16 large eggs, and 600 grams of self-raising flour. Now remember, to bake one cake, they must have that exact number of ingredients listed in our box at the top. Okay, so pause the video whilst you work out how many cakes each person can bake. Remember, they can't share any leftover ingredients. They can only bake with whatever ingredients they have. So if we start with David, 400 grams of softened butter would be enough to bake two cakes. 400 grams of caster sugar would also be enough for two cakes. However, he's only got four large eggs, which according to our recipe, is only enough for one cake. He's also got 400 grams of self-raising flour, which again would be enough for two cakes. 
That means, though, that although David has got three quarters of ingredients enough for two cakes, he's limited by the number of eggs he has, and he can only bake one cake. So he's got an excess of butter, sugar, and flour, but he's limited by the number of eggs he has. If you look at Jane then, she's got enough butter for four cakes, enough caster sugar for five cakes, enough eggs for four cakes, but only enough flour for three cakes. This means Jane, following that exact recipe, can only bake a maximum of three cakes because she is limited by the amount of self-raising flour. Now, we're going to look at applying this to the principle of photosynthesis next. And we can see how this idea of needing a set amount of ingredients or reactants or factors can then determine the rate of a reaction or from our analogy, the rate of cake making. So from our work so far on photosynthesis, we should understand that the rate of photosynthesis in a plant can be limited by light intensity, availability of water, availability of carbon dioxide, the availability of chlorophyll, and also temperature. Now the top four in that list, they're really important because they help form our word equation for the photosynthesis reaction. So if we're lacking any of those factors, photosynthesis will, have a real, uh, will occur at a low rate or it won't occur at all. So let's apply this then to our analogy that we used before. And we can use it again to discuss the law of limiting factors in relation to photosynthesis. So as you can see on the right hand side, I've included that photosynthesis word equation that we covered in our first lesson of the ecosystems topic. And on the top left, I've given you an example of a glucose recipe. Now we're doing this again to link back to our analogy of baking a cake. Okay, we often present, and we'll see this later when we look at graphs, we talk about arbitrary units of light. Now arbitrary means it's no set amount, it's like an example. So we've looked before how in our balanced equation we need six lots of carbon dioxide and six lots of water. That's where I get my six units from as an example. I've also then just gave some arbitrary units for light and chlorophyll. But if we imagine we need that exact number to make one glucose molecule, this can be our recipe, if you like, for photosynthesis. Now, like before, what we need to consider is this. So I'm going to show you two plants. I want you to consider how much glucose these two plants can make based on their available resources. So we've got plant one, that's got 12 units of carbon dioxide, 12 units of water, three arbitrary units of light, and four units of chlorophyll. Plant two has 12 units of carbon dioxide, 18 units of water, 12 arbitrary units of light, and eight units of chlorophyll. So pause the video whilst you work out following our glucose recipe, how many glucose molecules each plant can make. So next we'll go through the answers and the working out. So we've got our exact recipe there, our example recipe for glucose. Remember this is just uh, to explain this concept. So plant one then, if it's got 12 units of carbon dioxide, we'd say that'd be enough to make two molecules of glucose. 12 units of water would also be enough to make two units of glucose. Three arbitrary units of light would only be enough for one glucose molecule. And four units of chlorophyll would be enough for two glucose molecules. This means though, plant one 
can only make one glucose unit because it is limited by the amount of light it has. Plant two then, again, has enough units of carbon dioxide for two glucose molecules. It's got 18 units of water, which would be enough for three glucose molecules. It's got 12 arbitrary units of light, which would be enough for four glucose molecules. And then eight units of chlorophyll, which again would be enough for four glucose units or molecules. Now, plant two then could only make a maximum of two glucose units because it is limited by the amount of carbon dioxide it has. So both these plants we could talk about are using photosynthesis and their rate of photosynthesis will increase. However, because plant one is limited by its light availability, that rate then would start to plateau. Whereas plant two, that has enough light enough water and enough chlorophyll but is limited by the amount of carbon dioxide it has. So we describe that as the limiting factor. And in order for plant 2 to make more glucose, we would have to increase the amount of carbon dioxide it has. So if you gave it another 6 units, it could make some more glucose, in which case carbon dioxide and water then would be limiting factors which would have to be increased to increase the rate of photosynthesis. So next, we're just going to remind ourselves why these factors are important. And we're also going to show you some examples of what uh, rate of reaction graphs would look like if you're discussing photosynthesis and certain factors. So first off is chlorophyll. And hopefully you can remember then that chlorophyll is found in the chloroplasts of plant cells, particularly the palisade cells. And it is the green pigment responsible for absorbing light. And you can see it there under that microscopic image or in our diagram where chloroplasts are highlighted. On to our next factor, which is light. We know from our study of photosynthesis that plants cannot photo photosynthesize if they don't have enough light. That means then Increasing the light intensity will increase the rate of photosynthesis until it is no longer a limiting factor. What that means is if we represent that as a graph, our graph will look something like this. I'm going to explain this in more detail next. So this is our rate of photosynthesis looking at uh, the factor uh, and impact of light intensity. So along the bottom, the x-axis, we've got ever-increasing amounts of light intensity. And on our y-axis, we've got our rate of photosynthesis. And this could be looked at in terms of uh, oxygen produ uh, production. Uh, if you could measure it, you could look at glucose production as well. But oxygen production is one of the main common ways we look at the rate of photosynthesis. So this graph has got two stages. And the first stage, which is this... This shows you that as you increase the intensity of light, the rate of photosynthesis will also increase. Now, the second part of that graph is this bit here. So you can see the rate increases until it begins to plateau or stabilize and be a constant rate. Now, what this means is that despite increasing the intensity of light along the bottom, we are not increasing the rate of photosynthesis anymore. And there's one of two reasons of this. The first reason is that photosynthesis at this point is likely going to be limited by another factor. So we have enough light at this point, but we are now limited by something else like carbon dioxide, water or chlorophyll. If all those other factors were at their maximum and there was a plentiful supply of them, our other explanation is that it could have reached its maximum potential of photosynthesis. But the far more common answer is that at this point at the graph, 
one of those other factors is now limiting them. And if you increase the supply of carbon dioxide, water or chlorophyll, we could then see that rate increase again. So our next factor will be carbon dioxide. And again, just like light, even if we've got lots of light, if there's not enough carbon dioxide being supplied, the rate of photosynthesis will be limited. So increasing carbon dioxide will increase the rate of photosynthesis until it is no longer a limiting factor. And again, just like light, it can present itself like this graph. As you can see again, if you increase carbon dioxide concentration along the bottom, the rate will start to increase until it reaches a plateau. And at that point, we know some other factor will be limiting that rate of photosynthesis from increasing. And that is likely going to be the light intensity or the availability of water. So our final factor is temperature. And I'm going to start first of all with what the graph looks like if you could look at the impact of temperature on the rate of photosynthesis. And you can see it's different from the other factors of light and carbon dioxide. Okay, what happens with temperature then is that each living organism, including plants, will have an ideal range of temperatures that they can operate at their potential and at their best. If the temperature drops below that suitable range, then the rate of photosynthesis will also decrease. If the temperature increases beyond that range of temperatures, again, the rate of photosynthesis is going to decrease. You can see from our graph where the peak of that line is, that would be around the optimum temperature for this plant to photosynthesize. And you can see as we move away from that, either get too cold or too hot, that will negatively impact the rate of photosynthesis. Now, most plants have an optimum temperature range between 25 to 35 degrees Celsius. However, some plants are adapted to living in hotter climates and colder climates. They'll still present a graph that's similar, uh, similar to this one. However, the peak will just be shifted more to the left in a colder region or more to the right in a warmer region. So after that, I would like you to attempt this task. So you can see here that a scientist has plotted this graph of light intensity in units compared to the rate of photosynthesis in units. Now remember, these units are just arbitrary units. They're given as an example. So question one, the scientist says this, light stops being a limiting factor at a light intensity of 19 units. Looking at the graph, like you decide, is this correct? And the second question, what could be limiting the rate of photosynthesis at a light intensity of 25 units? Give one factor. So pause the video whilst you answer this question. So we're going to go through the answers now, and I hope you've had time to answer those. So for question one, Light stops being a limiting factor at a light intensity of 19 units. Is this correct? So we can say yes, this is correct. All right, because the rate of photosynthesis plateaus or it stops increasing after 19. I know this because if I look at my light intensity axes on the bottom, okay, I can see at 19, if I go up, that that line has reached its highest point. Now, it's important we are precise when we pick out the number. You can see it reaches that point at 19, not at 20. OK, because from 19, there's no change in that line. Secondly, then, what could be limiting the rate of photosynthesis at a light intensity of 25 units? So if you look at 25 units, you can see that that rate of photosynthesis hasn't increased. OK, that means the plant has got enough light or units of light at this point, so something else must be stopping it from photosynthesizing. The options you could have then are carbon dioxide or CO2 
water, temperature, or the availability or amount of chlorophyll. One of these factors must be limiting the rate of photosynthesis at this point. So next we have three apply to demonstrate exam style questions for you to attempt. Okay, so as normal, if you're doing it on paper, feel free to pause the video at each question and write your answer. Uh, if you've been set your assignment, you could find that this Word document attached or in the uh, notebook that accompanies it. Okay, so pause the video now whilst you attempt this question. So moving on to 1B and question 2. Again, pause the video here whilst you attempt these questions. This is question 2B and again, pause the video whilst you attempt these questions. And this is our third and final question. Pause the video whilst you answer A and B. So if we go through the marks then, starting with question one, you have to decide which uh, beaker would the water weed grow best in, and the answer was C. Uh, the second part of that then was to explain why the water weed in beaker B had uh, start to change uh, from dark green to a pale yellow, and that was because it was kept in the dark and it had no light. And then for part B, uh, you had to show another experiment and they added fertilizer to beaker E, suggested results this experiment. So the one with fertilizer will grow bigger than the one without. For question 2A, you had to complete the word equation for photosynthesis. So the first missing answer was water and the second missing answer was glucose. For part B then, you're presented with a graph looking at light intensity and the rate of photosynthesis. Okay, it says at which light intensity is light, was light a limiting factor for photosynthesis? Okay, the answer is one arbitrary unit. It's because from that point on, the rate will increase as the light units increase. What was the highest rate of photosynthesis? So if you look at where that line reached, it was at 210. And then for C, uh, we have to discuss one factor that could change to increase the rate of photosynthesis. And because this is talking about light, we can't say that. So it must be either carbon dioxide, temperature, so on to question three and our marks for this. This was a, a higher tiered question, so one with a bit more challenge. So for 3A, the gas collected in this experiment was not pure oxygen, so just a reason for this. So you can see here that we know the water weed, as well as photosynthesizing, will also respire. So it could also release carbon dioxide, which could be collected as well. Uh, but also we know uh, that through respiration, you also get the product water vapor as well. So that also could be collected uh, in the uh, test tube. And for our second question, we've got the graph, and it's very similar to what we've looked at before, but there's three different points. So we had light intensity going along the bottom and the rate increasing. We had three different lines where the different amounts of carbon dioxide concentration show. So we had a low carbon dioxide, medium, and a high. What that is showing you then Initially, as you increase the light intensity, that increased the rate of photosynthesis. But also, depending on the amount of carbon dioxide concentration, that would also impact the rate. Okay, so that rate was limited uh, by the carbon dioxide, and then once that was increased, that also then increased the rate of reaction. So to finish our lesson, we have a list here of core questions. Just pause the video and go through that list and see how confident you are with those questions. Here are the answers then for these core questions. And again, if you understood those, it shows you have a good understanding of photosynthesis and how factors impact it. Remember to submit your assignment and to attach your work if necessary. Thank you for joining me.